hard porno. That means that the, uh, the image of women is a disaster. We are object just only to give pleasure uh, to men with all the respect to men. And uh, the empathy, that is when uh, the empathy is very important as is in the adolescent where this uh, important uh, behavior is developed. The empathy in adolescence is decreasing. So uh, for example, the, the prosecutor in our country uh, has warned uh, that all the, the crimes committed by sexual crimes committed by minors are increasing. Why? Because they are they feel that porno is the the the, the fear uh, is the real image of what sexuality is expected to be. So that's uh, very important. Uh, I will jump about the, the legal framework, framework because you know already, and if you are more interested, I will give the, uh, the presentation because I don't want to spend uh, time with this. Congratulations for the Digital Service Act. This is a very important point, but it's not, even, it's not enough. I'm very clear, and I just want to give uh, um, the main uh, message. The Article 35 is very important because... Um, and the, the Article 20, uh, 28, but for example, is only ap applicable to several uh, enterprises. Why not extend this article to all the porno web, uh, um, websites, for example? I have uh, studied in my country and none of the porno websites that are established in Spain are really verifying AIDS. You just have to click, yes, I am more than 18 years old. And that's happened all over the world. And do you know which is the business for this kind of enterprises? It's not the money that they take with the porno videos that uh, consumers uh, create. It's not that. It's all the business that they create with all the profiling of the porno web users. They are selling that data uh, to uh, marketing specialized in sexuality. I mean, I am, um, I am, uh, I am I'm not in con uh, I'm not against uh, uh, with this in adult people. I just want to uh, to make an advice about how this is affecting uh, to minors. Um, and it's very important, Article 45, that mandates the Commission to support and promote the development and implementation of voluntary standards for uh, targeted measures to protect uh, children online. Uh, the Audiovisual Service Media Directive uh, has been uh, also uh, a very important uh, legislation because they obliged to, uh, this industry to establish appropriate measures to protect minors from programmers, user-generated videos and audiovisual commercial communications. Now we know how social networks and how the use of internet with, no, with any kind of controls are damaging physical, emotional, and mental health in minors. We have the studies in the United States, uh, the prosecutors and some education uh, civil uh, NGOs has to uh, Google Meta for all the images that they are creating uh, to minors. The problem is that families are not yet aware. They are aware about how tobacco and alcohol uh, no, no, no parent with any any kind of common sense will give alcohol or tobacco or drugs to a nine years old. But why they give an, a smartphone with they uh, with nine years old with any kind of theoretical and practical approach? Is if we were uh, a Ferrari with nine years old with any kind? I mean, it's not we are. And what we promote is just to accompany. Um, and moderate the use depending on the age. I, I will talk about this and uh, what the um, the global um, mundial uh, um, the the OMS, the global mundial uh, organization, and the American pediatrician and the Spanish pediatrician uh, has um, has established. Uh, we have. Um, uh, detected some regulatory gaps that I hope that you will repeat in the next uh, European legislature. And you will have, uh, I will propose, uh, now we have different uh, European legislation related to minors. One is the GDPR, another is the Digital Service Act, also the CESAM, uh, also the draft of CESAM, but there is, uh, it's not a legal framework. I will propose you a general uh, regula um, regulatory, uh, like the GDPR, a general uh, reglamentation about how to protect minors in the digital uh, world. Um, 
And of course, I would like to uh, appreciate uh, the important steps that you have done in this legislation. For example, uh, the design regulation raises serious concerns. For example, age verification systems, uh, we advocate for a general obligation of their implementation in app stores, and not only as a possible voluntary restriction for gatekeepers, as well in messaging application. Age verification systems should be a general obligation. Uh, now I am using my enforcement powers, just checking one data that is age. And one of the principles of the GDPR is uh, the, the, the accuracy of data. And uh, none of the companies are doing that. And they are creating extra threats. Uh, it's amazing that in, two, uh, in 2023, almost 60% of global websites containing child sexual abuse material were hosted in the European uh, Union. And as I said uh, before, uh, I will propose you a, a general regulation for the protection of children online with several subjects, addictive design, parental controls by design. In France, they have launched a law, a national law, mm -hmm. and since uh, next June, any device who is uh, uh, who's been to be sold in, in France has to, uh, to offer by default parental control system. Why not in Europe? I mean, because uh, usually families have not the knowledge, uh, enough knowledge to configure the parental control system. Why not the, tele the telecom companies when they, they are so proactive to sell a smartphone? They con don't configure it if they know that the user is going to be a minor. You can oblige uh, with the European legislation. Also, uh, in relation with the Directive 2011-93 uh, on combating sexual abuse and sexual exploitation of minors and child pornography, there is a possibility to extend and include procedural standing in, uh, in class actions for mental health damage uh, with same global standards, uh, for, for example, uh, like for example, with artificial intelligence that you have already uh, done. One important point, very important, uh, neuro rights and neuro data. I, I, don't, I don't know, you know, that now uh, scientifics are increasing a lot. Uh, we are working with uh, an, an important Spanish neuroscientific uh, who was appointed uh, by Obama to create um, the Human Brain Project. Uh, his name is Rafael Juste. I hope that he will be able to come in the legislature to the European Parliamentary. And he has, uh, now they are able to read all the brain and they are able to read all the conscious and unconscious connections in our brains, but not only to read, they are able to modify our connections. In terms of health, that's amazing. They have uh, made uh, possible that a tetraplegic uh, woman could, uh, were able, uh, was able to, to, to work. That's incredible. But imagine this uh, ability in terms of uh, a, a totalitarian government or in, te, in, in the hands of Google or Meta. Imagine, because if you can modify the connections in our brains, you can modify what we believe, what we feel, how we behave, ever, ever. So uh, he has created a foundation that is called a Neural Rights Foundation, and they have been studying the 30 main uh, American companies who are selling this device. Now, to change this connection in the brains, you need to have a chip introduced inside your head, or you need to have something outside, and you have to pay for it. It's 500 euros. I don't encourage to, <laughs> you to buy it. But they have studied these 30 companies, and 29 of them are selling this, this data to third parties. And with this data, they are able to create an avatar of your own brain. And my next question to Rafael was, okay, now I, I have to be so silly to buy something to put in my head so in, in, the enterprise could read my mind. Okay, but with the internet of things that is creating um, electromagnetic, uh, electronic impulses, our connections are electronic also. Uh, they, it could be some kind of interference, and he, he told me, yes, Mar, in the next, in, in, in short term, this is going to be possible. So he's in, trying to launch the five neuro data, and one, the most important data is the right to have your identity in your brain, and privacy brain, uh, priv I mean, it's nothing to do about privacy in cookies, this is external. If, you don't pro if we don't protect our privacy in our brain, we are completely lost. 
I mean, it's not in terms of democracy. This is the core of the European, uh, of our values, of our rights. So it would be really, really important that in the next, in the next legislature, you will uh, make a framework about neural data. We are working on this and, and offer you all the work that we have done uh, uh, because uh, it would be um, it would be easier. For example, another proposal: uh, Why is uh, now is able uh, with the terrorist European legislation that the digital platforms um, should download the materials in less than one hour? Why why don't apply this also in case of sexual abuse of minors? It's possible they do with terrorism. Why they are so lazy? about sexual abuse in minors. That's, that's one point. <laughs> okay, uh, the framework uh, should be uh, holistic because uh, a very important point, they are offering free services. For example, after, pandemic, uh, after the COVID, Google offer free tools in all schools in all uh, in European countries, but it's not free. They are, uh, mon they are monetization, uh, all children, uh, internet activities, and they are creating captivity clients, and they are configuring consciously addictive products to create addictive, cl addictive consumers since very early stage. And this is very important. I am very committed with this, and I feel that this is a crime against public health. I mean, it's the first time, the first time that governments consciously or unconsciously and the education systems are damaging the brains and the neurodevelopment of minors. Why? Because they are being so pressed by the industry that uh, all the social, um, the responsible use of technology, digitalization is so modern. I want to be on the top of the, on the, top of the list. And now they are teaching in, in, in a digital way since one year old to 18 years old. And experts in health have proved that it is terrible about brain development. The American uh, Pediatric Association, the Spanish Pediatric Association, uh, they have created uh, the digital family plan. Uh, uh, based on scientific evidence, they have launched this awareness. From zero to two years old, babies and, and, and minors should not use any electronic device, none hours per day, included, uh, included TV, because it's the most important stage in terms of uh, brain development. From zero to five, one, year, one hour, sorry, sorry, one hour daily, and from five to eight, two hours daily. Imagine a school that from uh, in, in that uh, daily, they are teaching in a digital uh, five hours, and then after they have to do the homework, in the, in the computer also. This is damaging uh, the brain. And we have the most uh, important figures about anxiety, depression, and even uh, suicide because of this. So uh, it would be wonderful that in the, new, in the next legislation, uh, you give the criteria based on the scientific evidence and based on the health experts about how to teach in the digital work uh, in schools and to protect minors in, infant, in, in kindergarten and primary schools. It should be reduced. In kindergarten, it should be forbidden. And in primary, it should be limited as maximum one hour daily. And also, uh, one, uh, one suggestion. For example, now, um, tobacco companies, they are obliged. If I want to, to buy uh, tobacco, uh, uh, they, they are obliged to advertise about the effects in health. Why we in, with a technological industry, they are free to do whatever they do. And why families don't, are not aware about the damages that this smartphone, if you give without any kind of control, uh, parental controls, schedules, and you allow your teenagers that sleep with the, with the device in the room, uh, that's terrible because they, they are, there is a lackness of, um, uh, of rest. Uh, and this is very important also for neurodevelopment. So it would be also some suggestions uh, that I would like uh, to share. Um, and this is, uh, this is a 
a very big part is not only industry, also telecommunications, game consoles, browsers, and app stores. For example, in this verification system that I will explain uh, uh, next, uh, we are trying to work with all of them. Um, well, I don't. I I will not. I will not uh, focus on the fundamental rights because I want to go directly uh, to the points. Uh, mainly, uh, technology solutions should not create new threats. And for example, what uh, I will say an example: Meta is using uh, Jyoti uh, to verify age. Jyoti uh, is a British uh, company. This British company is dealing with millions of data of millions of European minors. And why? If it's not necessary, because we can verify aid systems in a different way, much more accurate with privacy, for example. And technology should be safe by design. And, uh, and for example, the missus uh, are not uh, able to create any extra uh, threats. Why have, uh, what have we done at our national level? We are working in four, um, in four areas. Uh, one is the regulatory scope, second the institutional scope, digital health, and digital education. In the regulatory... Um, uh, no, I'm... Um, okay. Ah, three minutes. Oh, sorry. Okay, uh, only three minutes. I, I will. I, I will move. We are work. Uh, we, we are. We are working with pediatricians, um, and we are working in a draft of national law to protect uh, health uh, in, in minors. Also, we are working in an expert committee created by the um, by the infant uh, ministry, and at the European Data Protection Board, we are collaborating to to with our enforcement actions to verify how Google, Meta, OnlyFans, Pornhub are verifying um, AIDS. And now, um, okay. Um, and now uh, I will I will extend uh, just uh, my last three minutes about aid verification uh, proposal. This is the most uh, with Campbell. I am uh, uh, this is the most accurate uh, systems uh, according with the GDPR. Why? Because it's a double blind method. Uh, we propose uh, now um, now the actual uh, systems uh, present several risks. Uh, based on they are based on profiling, on biometric data exchange, on central data access. And what we propose is that only the condition of access authorization must be processed. So, for example, if, one, if I want to consume porno because I am more than 18 years old, I will, uh, I will take my identity card, my passport, my drive license, my health card, and I will scan this with an app. Uh, the Spanish government is working on this because we have been appointed by the European Commission as a pilot project uh, based on the DSA, so that's very important. And this app will, will read, okay, this is an official document, you are more than 18 years old, so it will give an attribute, authorized to get access. The, 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 the porno website or the alcohol company doesn't know if I am a woman, if I am a man, if I am 50, 50 years old, 18 years old. And of course, they don't know if, whose uh, minors are trying to get access to. So that's very important. And, uh, and the app is not going to know why, why I'm, for which is the finality that I'm going to use this attribute. They don't know if I want to get access, if I want to get uh, online uh, bet or I want to uh, buy alcohol. So that's very important to avoid profiling. And the website uh, who is uh, reading my attribute that I am authorized to get access doesn't know if I, uh, my identity. So that's very important because we live in a democracy and we don't know a profiling of adult uh, porno website uh, consumers, uh, for example. Um, uh, we are working on this in two main uh, directions. One is with the European Data Protection Board. We have proposed an opinion, and more or less after summer, we will launch an opinion of the European Board about uh, uh, the criteria to verify it. We are working with all our colleagues. We have meeting with Google, Meta, Apple, uh, all the stakeholders, and also with the Federal Trade Commission and the Privacy Agency in California, where we are trying to push to have these standards as a global uh, standards also. 
And uh, as I told you, uh, we have the mandate uh, from, from the European Commission to work as a, a project pilot uh, because we have, this is not only theory. I don't have time um, to read uh, all the, the principles. We have all the principles uh, in English, but Luis, uh, who is the creator uh, of the principles and the AIDS verification system will explain uh, later on. And the most important point, this is not only theory. We have proof in a practical way. And we have put, uh, we have proof in Android, in Windows, and it works. And we have meetings with Google, with Apple, uh, and with Microsoft, because we have proof in these three main uh, frameworks, and it works. Uh, their engineers have uh, checked, and they cannot, they, they couldn't say anything. Now, the industry has no excuse, because we are offering an age verification system that is totally respectful with minors. They protect minors. They protect democracy. And they are totally aligned with privacy and security. So uh, I encourage you, maybe now I am trying to push because I only have the competence at the national level, it's a pity. <laughs> but uh, maybe uh, in, the, in the new legislation, you can oblige with the European uh, general regulation. So thank you very much for your interest. Thank you very much, Mark, for this very comprehensive contribution. I think you can all see how powerful and how committed and the leading role that Mar is taking, not only in Spain, but as well at a global level. So I very much, I'm very much happy to share this goal with Mar and to try and advance in these, uh, in these rights together. I also want to thank you very much as well for the role that you have been having in Spain. And just as a personal note, Mar has been extremely instrumental together with the Minister of, of, of Child, Childhood and, and Youth in the Spanish context. And then together with actually six um, civil society organizations, they actually set up this important committee of experts. And so they are working and this is a very great example, actually, why it's so important the multi-stakeholder approach. As you can see in her, in her work, she has been in contact with pediatrician, with scientists. So this is kind of the exercise, the type of exercise that we also do in the European Parliament intergroup. We very much believe in the multi-stakeholder approach. I just also wanted to say, but I'm pretty sure that my colleagues from the commission will say, in the case you were mentioning about the, you were talking about the Digital Services Act and as we, um, among your suggestion, you were wondering how come some of the porn sites were not included. And actually, again, my colleagues will say, as a matter of fact, among the very large um, online platforms, three of the porn sites will be actually are included now in the in the vlogs. So yeah, you will see that actually this is something as well that I've been working on. You're talking about the addictive partners. The European Parliament has taken a very important role in here by issuing actually on initiative reports specifically on the addictive patterns. And so we're actually trying and see, as you can see, we actually have a match the eye to eye and we are waiting for the next parliamentary term to be as productive as this one has been. And last but not least, for the case of the neuro rights, uh, we've been discussing this. We would be very happy to try and see this come into fruition maybe next year. How important it is, in fact, to try and see how the neuro rights and the way the science and the artificial intelligence can be actually used and the risk that is asked not only for children, but as well for adults. And I just wanted to give the very quick example of Chile, who has been actually leading the way globally. Chile has recently actually changed the constitution to include among the fundamental rights to the neuro rights, which actually I think is going to be something that we're going to be looking at in the future. Thank you so much again, Mar, for your wonderful and tireless leadership in this regard. We are very happy to have you here and your contribution. So we'll now actually lead the floor to An Andrea Tognoni, the head of EU Affairs of Five Rights Foundation, who will be accompanying us in these next two very intense panels. And so, yeah, Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you, Emilian. Thank you, Mar, uh, and everyone for, for being here. Um, without further ado, I would uh, immediately jump on, on the topic. Uh, so trying to set the scene uh, uh, a bit more about age assurance and age verification, uh, get some definitions on the table. I would turn immediately to Lucrezia, who is a member of cabinet of the Justice Commissioner, to give a bit the uh, law of the EU land on, on the topic. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'd like also to start by thanking the organizers for uh, organizing this event. It brings all of us together, giving the different perspectives and shows how important it is indeed to strike the right balance and uh, between the different fundamental rights at stake and to take into account the different perspectives as well, and also to, um, to get together the national and the European level to uh, 
to create and exploit as many synergies as possible in this important, uh, um, in this important challenge that we have ahead of us. Uh, I should also say that uh, um, whatever I say just reflects my opinion, my personal opinion, it doesn't bind neither the commissioner nor the commission I work for. And uh, now um, also my commissioner is on a pay leave. And so I'm together with our colleagues, we are attached also to the cabinet of vice president of Commissioner Europa. So it doesn't bind commissioner and it doesn't bind the VP. <laughs> it's just my, um, my experience uh, that I would like to share of uh, dealing with the uh, data protection uh, and privacy in the last, uh, during this mandate. And uh, during this mandate, I could see that indeed protecting children's rights in particular online has been a key priority for, um, for the commission. It's been important, it is important because of protecting um, children privacy, that means protecting the privacy of the children communications, but also their data. And it's important also to um, prevent children or limiting uh, the possibilities that children are exposed to illegal content, dangerous content, for the reasons that uh, Mar explained so well before me. And for both of these aims, uh, working on age verification uh, is, is very important. They're in doing so, uh, I will repeat myself now, given that other speakers have said it before, there is a need to find a balance uh, between protecting children from threats that can come from being exposed to the uh, internet uh, world, but also protecting their, uh, their privacy. We cannot, uh, um, we cannot just to ensure that children are protecting, get as many, as many data, as, as, many, as much data as possible to verify that they are really children. I think so, at a certain stage we were speaking, there were some uh, examples that were given uh, that, for instance, to um, identify whether the user was a child, you could see what kind of user, what kind of contact the user was accessing. And this would be a bit of a very bad scenario because then the tech companies would have even more data to the person is, uh, is a minor who could not access the, um, the content that they were probably already accessing. There is therefore a need to work on this and to work on it from different perspectives, different dimensions, and that's uh, why, um, why it's good that we are having this discussion uh, today. In, um, from a justice portfolio, the, um, what has been very important has been, uh, the have been the principles that have been uh, set out in the GDPR and already in the first GDPR report that we have done in this mandate in 2020, we uh, flagged two key aspects when it came to children and um, interaction online. The first one was related to children consent and the need to harmonize also uh, age for children consent uh, and uh, also the need to work on tools that could uh, um, facilitate age verification. And this is important to clarify um, the rights of children for the children for the, and the parents. It is important for, um, uh, for the operators as well, the tech operators as well, because they need to know how best to um, target their services, but it's important also for the enforcers. And there have been a number of cases that have shown how important this was. For instance, the, um, uh, the TikTok, TikTok case that has been... Um, uh, handled by different by the DPC in Ireland, but has been also followed by different uh, um, data protection authorities across Europe and by the EDPB, and that has shown how uh, important it, it is, and also um, how uh, how important it is actually to ensure that the principles of the GDPR are concretely applied when it comes to data minimization, when it comes to privacy by default, and to the fairness. Because um, the techniques that are often used do not reflect these principles, and which means, in turn, that they um, hamper, that they hinder fundamental, uh, uh, fundamental rights of children. And uh, the fall, the legislation that came afterwards, the DSA, 
that has mentioned has been mentioned already is built up on this experience and uh, i think it is um, it has benefited also on the lessons learned of the few years of application of the gdpr before and it is particularly important that uh, uh, in article uh, 28 and 35 as has been uh, mentioned before there are precise um, provisions that uh, um, force um, uh, service providers to have a, to take measures that protect privacy of children and that they also um, have provisions that limit the processing of data of children and also that they clarify that, um, that this processing of data cannot be done precisely to, to verify the age uh, of children. It is uh, the GDPR and the DSA work together uh, complement each other. And that means that the enforcers also uh, work together and should continue to work together in the future to ensure that these two instruments um, are well applied and can uh, ser serve best the, um, also the, the goals that uh, they are for which they have been um, and they have been adopted in this respect i think the it's it's been important that uh, um, also more recently during the council of uh, um, the telecom council last week there was a common declaration including the commission but also the member states who have agreed to work together on um, developing the, uh, the guidance for um, implementing the, um, the DSA provisions and in particular also to work together when it came to age, um, to age verification. And uh, in all that has been done, I think there are different, there is a, um, when it comes to protecting children, there is really a discussion to be had with different, uh, um, with different perspective. And the idea is really to take all this perspective together to share the experience with member states, to use also the, um, the, the progress that has already been done at national level and to build upon it. And I think my colleague June will explain a bit more into details um, what our work at the commission has, be, has been. In, uh, in this respect, but on my side, I just wanted to stress really um, that it's a common, um, I wouldn't say fight, but it's certainly a common challenge that we all have to tackle together between the different enforcers, including data protection authorities, digital services coordinators, the, commi the commission and others. And also that needs to involve um, national and uh, EU level together. And what is also something that uh, Mari said, and for me is very important, is that uh, Europe really needs to, um, to lead the, also the reflections and work on this, uh, also at global level. And in this respect, the commissioner has had a lot of exchanges as well with the FTC, in particular when it came to um, dark patterns. He had also launched again a, um, an informal dialogue with the FTC and hearing that the data protection authorities are, are also communicating with uh, their equivalent um, in the US is also very important for us because that means that that can that can have a further push in um, establishing in using these uh, technologies uh, privacy protecting technologies that are at the same time also protecting children and maybe uh, one can think also about our bilateral fora that we have with uh, with us where for instance like the trading technology council that could be a good um, a good forum also to discuss how to work together to, um, on this technology and also how to promote our European standards in this, um, in this respect. I would stop it here just as a framework and leave it to, to the colleagues. Thank you, thank you, uh, Lucrezia. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, indeed, uh, I think it's important uh, that you close on that point on, on global cooperation. Um, as I would now pass the floor to uh, Julia Cook from uh, the UK Ofcom in the UK. Uh, While well, transposing GDPR into UK law, uh, you also passed the age appropriate design code uh, now after 
uh, passing the Online Safety Act, uh, of course, uh, you, you issued guidelines also on age verification. So can you give us uh, a bit more detail on that work? Of course, it's lovely to be here. Thank you so much to the organizers. Hopefully you can hear okay. Um, it's lovely to be here, so thank you for having us. Ofcom is the UK's communications and online safety regulator. So we um, received powers under the Online Safety Act, which passed in 2023, so just last year. Um, we've four large strands to the work that we're doing around age assurance. So there are other elements of the Online Safety Act that we're happy to talk about separately, but with conscious of time, we'll focus on age assurance. So with the Online Safety Act, Ofcom's in the process of implementing a number of pieces of guidance and codes of um, practice to fully implement that and have it in force. The four strands of our work cover um, video sharing platform supervision. So we transposed the EU's Audiovisual Media Services Directive about four years ago, and we have a num um, quite a lot of experience of regulating services under that and seeing them implement age assurance there. So we've already got a good um, sounding board from which to work from. We're doing a lot of work on research for age assurance that covers technical capability, how um, effective it is, how it works, but also what users' attitudes are, and that's all users, so not just adult uh, users on adult platforms, but children, parents and carers in the broadest sense, so from, for some very modern families as well, rather than traditional um, parents and caregivers. We're also doing a lot of work to build our technical capacity. So we're building a team of technical experts who can understand and test um, how a lot of technology works. And we're also engaging with platforms, so engaging with all of the different services within scope of the Online Safety Act to understand how they will be protecting users, how they understand the risks their services pose to users, and how they understand age assurance to be able to be implemented in a way to effectively look at children's um, rights. And that's all of their rights to make sure that all of them are respected, including things like their right to play. So as Leanne mentioned, it's not about blocking their access in all instances it's about giving them a fruitful and safe environment in which to thrive. In terms of um, what that then looks like for the um, stuff that we have to implement, we have three key phases. You'll hear a number of um, numbers throughout this. It's, it's a big piece of legislation. It took a very long time to pass, so I'm afraid it's a little bit complex, but hopefully this will, will help make it a little bit more accessible. But with three phases, we've already consulted on illegal harms. So I won't uh, speak about that today. Today's focus will be on the second phase, which is our protection of children. We've already um, published one piece of guidance um, under that, and we hope to publish our next one next month. So stay posted, more details to follow on it. And then the third phase will be on user empowerment. So how all users can empower themselves um, and help be empowered by platforms to have the experiences they want. For that um, second uh, phase, for the protection of children, I mentioned that we've already published some guidance. So that was for um, service providers that publish pornographic content. And we've already um, consulted on that guidance, um, which looks at how age assurance can be implemented on that particular type of service. And the reason I emphasise that is because that's very much where children should not be accessing um, pornographic content. There's not really any um, instance in which we envisage children can see that for many of the reasons that um, my esteemed colleague from the Spanish um, Authority has already mentioned. So in that instance, we've come out with um, a list of non-exhaustive um, age assurance methods that could be effective. So already two caveats, and I'll go into detail on that in a minute. But essentially, we've brought out six options that could be effective age assurance methods. One is open banking. Um, one is photo ID matching, so matching that the person accessing the service is the person um, within the ID. One is facial estimation, one's mobile network operator checks. So in the UK, to be able to get a SIM card to use a mobile, you have to be able to prove that you are 18. So that's why in the UK context, that's deemed effective. 
Another is credit card checks. So again, in the UK, you have to have gone through a number of checks and only 18 year olds can have credit cards. And then the final one is digital identity wallets. So those are the six options that at present we think could be effective, but it depends on how they are deployed. And that is a very key caveat. As I said, it's not non-exhaustive and we've left room for innovation because we know that some of the solutions that learned colleagues are coming up with develop at pace and we want to leave room for improvements and other methods that will be effective. All of these are looked at with an outcome focus. So the outcome is to protect children and make sure that they are able to thrive. So in looking at any of these options, it's always with that underlying outcome in mind. I've already mentioned non-exhaustive and could be, so let me zero in on could be a little bit more. In terms of how it could be effective, firstly, that depends on the risk profiles of the service. So what risks you're trying to um, address and what other mitigations you have in place. So as has already been mentioned, age assurance isn't a silver bullet and will likely be deployed with a number of other measures. So part of the could be is what other measures are deployed. Part of that is that it needs to... Um, comply with data protection legislation. We've worked very closely with the Information Commissioner's Office, which is the UK's data protection authority, so the equivalent of the AEPD in Spain. We've worked very closely with them on um, our guidance. They've also brought out a lot of guidance on how age assurance can be done in a complementary way that supports data protection rights. So we haven't sought to um, reiterate that guidance we merely signpost to it and acknowledge that both work alongside one another um, and the four requirements for any of those um, methods so that they could be effective or that it's technically accurate so that it does actually work in lab environments that it's robust so it works in the real world not just in a lab that it's reliable so it consistently works no matter what happens and we're thinking there as well about things like lighting and um, if people are trying to evade it and um, and finally that it is fair so it works um for for everybody and when we talk about fairness there it's around the internal factors on the age assurance methods. So that's the internally, um, any of their processing is fair, particularly um, if, for example, things like face estimation, if that's looking at data sets, it needs to be fair to everybody, no matter what. We've also got two supplementary factors. Uh, one is accessibility. So that's that it has to be effective for everybody to use based on external factors. So that's acknowledging that, for example, not everybody has a passport or a hard identifier like a driving license. A lot of people won't have access to those and they also still need to be able to be given access online. If they're adults or if they're children, they need to be protected from those pornographic services. We also talk about interoperability. And that's very much with an eye to the future. We haven't come out with any um, specific standards at the moment, but with an eye to the future, we want as many of, um, options where you can look at age assurance to work across different um, services, across different instances where people need to um, assess their age. Finally, we have a number of record keeping duties in our guidance. So users have to be able, um, sorry, platforms have to be able to um, explain why they think what they're doing works, why they think it meets all of those requirements, and they have to be able to defend that. So it's very similar to accountability principles under the UK GDPR Article 5.2. We are also due to publish, as I mentioned, some guidance next month. So that will look more broadly at how age assurance can be used to protect children on services where they should be there. So slightly different to where there's pornographic um, content, but it will also look at areas where children could be on the service, but there's specific instances of harmful content that they shouldn't have access to. So it's making sure that children have age appropriate experiences and are very much included um, and have a positive um, experience on those services. It goes without saying that for all of this, we've engaged extensively with stakeholders, be that um, data protection authorities, be that the online services users themselves through a lot of the research that we've undertaken and with civil society um, and children's rights experts. We know that this needs to be a holistic response that works for all users, um, whether that's the adults trying to access pornographic services or the children that need to be protected from that. So we do engage quite broadly and we continue to do that.
we will be publishing that guidance for consultation in May. We encourage everybody to um, you know, respond to that consultation. We want to hear what works, um, but we equally want to know if there are areas where there is technology that we are not aware of. We, we want to know about it to be able to assess it and see if there's other options um, that are available. That's a very quick overview because I, I am conscious of time, but happy to talk about it in more detail, including how we work um, with our international partners as well. Because, of course, it doesn't just work for users in the UK. It has to be a solution that works for everybody and protects children everywhere. So thank you for having us today. And I will hand back. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Julia. So we, we heard a lot uh, of the importance of the, the principles or factors that, that you mentioned. Uh, I think we've heard many uh, mentions of different techniques. So let me turn to Yin, the voice of the industry, to put some maybe some order among all these techniques. So where is the industry at on this on this topic? Maybe starting from also the importance of shared standards, technicals, as well as definitions on, uh, on this to really be able to scale up at the, at the global level. Ian, please. Thank you, Andrea. And uh, my apologies for not being there in person. I'm actually in California where I've just been speaking to the um, uh, state assembly, which passed um, in their first committee 10 nil yesterday. So 10 votes in favor uh, of age verification for adult content. And I think that's in large part because of the work we were able to point to in uh, in the in Europe, uh, specifically the EU Consent Project, uh, which is now a non-profit based in Brussels, EU Consent ASBL, um, which I'm the Secretary of General for. And, and, and perhaps I'll be wearing that hat more than anything else when I speak to you today. You know, the, the Internet was not designed for children. And I always say in 10 years time, we'll look back in horror at what we were allowing our kids to see and do and who we were allowing them to talk to online without any proper protection. Uh, but the trouble is, I've been saying we'll look back in 10 years time for about the last five years. So excuse me if I'm a little bit frustrated that we have not yet managed to get together and solve this problem. Um, a fantastic starting point was the EU Consent Project, a pilot project initiated by the European Parliament and then um, sort of funded through June and her team. Um, and I think what was great about that was we brought everybody together in a room, much as you're all there today. Um, we had CoFace and Eurochild and other civil society organisations. We had Google and Meta. We had all the big trade associations. We had Professor Sonia Livingston and Professor Simone van der Hoff um, giving us the child rights and the privacy perspective. Um, and we had a lot of in input as well from the intergroup on child rights. And you know, through that project, we were able to implement in 18 months, an interoperable solution where you could prove your age to one website and then reuse that same proof of age across other websites without taking any further action. And I think it's just a really good example of how if you can co-create with all the right stakeholders in the room, and believe me, I would love to get everybody back in a room and lock the door to solve this problem, um, you can come up with some great answers. Now, um, sadly, there was no preparatory action to follow on from that pilot, and I, and I would hope that that might be something the Parliament would come back to look at again, because we do need to get everybody together to solve this problem. There have been some great innovations since um, we finished that first pilot, um, and, and we've heard already from AEPD and also the work of the CNEEL. And what we've now done in our second phase of the project, which is now funded by, by Safe Online, um, you know, the global fund that's ch ch tackling child sexual abuse online. Um, in our second phase, we've now iterated the way we approach this to incorporate these concepts of a, a device, an age verification app on a device, um, and also the double blind approach that the Keneal have been championing. So we were able to announce that last week at a Global Age Assurance Standards Summit in Manchester, where we had over 660 participants uh, which is an astonishing number for, for a conference, particularly just on age assurance. Um, and I'd like to you know, thank my colleague Tony Allen at the Age Check Certification Scheme for putting that together, also funded by Safe Online. And the standards are moving forward tremendously well. So we have an IEEE standard which was approved um, just a couple of weeks ago, and we could now start auditing and certifying against 
And the ISO um, took to a committee draft stage, the ISO 27566, which is a framework for online age assurance. Um, so standards are um, catching up as well, which provide a way forward. Just a word on terminology, because it, it does vary. In America, we just talk about age verification, but all those standards have settled on age assurance being the general term. And then sitting within it, you would have both age verification, so the traditional checking of a particular date of birth and age estimation techniques, which are based on you know, perhaps some features we might have or our behaviors online, facial age estimation being the best example. Both of these techniques can now be done completely on your own handset or on your own computer. So if you're doing, for example, a facial age estimation with your phone, you might take a selfie and no, none of your personal data needs to leave your phone. That entire calculation, which is accurate to within a year and a half with the current state of the art, um, can be done on the device. Anyway, so we've incorporated some of these concepts from um, European digital uh, um, data protection authorities. Um, and what we hope now to do is to take that forward into a further pilot by the end of the year. Um, we're reaching out to large platforms um, to have them participate in that pilot. And um, we hope that this solution, which is a tokenized solution, uh, will address many of the concerns that people have had about some of the earlier attempts at age assurance. Um, I was able to talk about that in, in the state capitol here in Sacramento just yesterday, and I believe it was it was it was all that work which which meant that um, a, a very skeptical committee focused on privacy and consumer protection passed um, passed that law by ten votes to nil. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there, Andre. I'm happy to come back and answer any other questions. Thank you, Ian. That was uh, very exhaustive and very concise. So thanks a lot. And we will indeed come back to you with, with some questions. Uh, I am taking the liberty as a moderator to merge a bit the conversation we had uh, uh, planned to have in, in two separate uh, say phases in the interest of time. So let me um, move uh, immediately to June to talk about uh, <laughs> this um, all the projects that the Commission is, is working on, uh, um, Uconsent uh, has been one of them. We know that there are several others that are ongoing or just uh, started, notably prompted by the, the DSA uh, provisions that were, uh, that were introduced in the, in the regulation, as well as others. So uh, please, tell me. And uh, if I talk too long, you can grab the mic, literally pull it off me. So, uh, so thank you. Thank you for organizing it. Thank you for inviting me. Um, there is a lot to say from the Commission's point of view. I will try to be as concise as I can. I'm delighted to hear from Ian and uh, that, you know, the work that really did start here in the Parliament with EU consent is having such a global impact. That's fantastic to hear. And as we know, laws like the GDPR, starting with the AVMSD that we've heard about, and now the third member of that holy trinity, the DSA, are also having a very big impact uh, within the EU, but also beyond mm. our borders. And as we heard from, from Julie from Ofcom, just as in the UK, it's important that Ofcom talk to the information commissioner. So we also see that it's essential that we try to navigate a way through this legal Sudoku of DSA, AVMSD, GDPR, plus national approaches, national history, national plans, that we find common solutions that are European solutions to avoid fragmentation, because that isn't going to help anyone. Um, and it's certainly not going to help um, actual implementation of the DSA. And just to clarify, Article 28, which talks about a high level of privacy, safety and security for children, applies to all platforms. It does say if you're, no, you can, if you're reasonably assured that a minor is a child, you can't find, you can't dig for more information to be 100% certain. Um, so you can't dig for more data. Um, and if you're looking, why haven't we issued any guidance or something on the DSA yet? It's because we've taken the exact opposite approach to the UK. We've jumped straight into enforcement. The DSA has applied to the first set of 19 very large online platforms and search engines as of last September-ish, August, when they had to start their risk assessment cycle. We've already got a case about a TikTok involving child protection and two other cases 
uh, with different platforms on different issues, because it's obviously a very wide, very broad piece of legislation. And now we have three of the big porn um, the firms who come into scope as of 20th of April. So the guidance follows, but really it's a very strong political signal. We mean business with the DSA, and the DSA now applies to all digital services, digital intermediaries, who offer their services across Europe as of mid-February. So two months now, um, with the digital services coordinators being then responsible in the member states for those who are not the very large platforms where the commission's responsible. So that's just a bit to show that it's really complex, but we're active in the field. And as has been said by others, what we think is really important is that we take a proportionate and a risk-based approach. Signing up for a Lego newsletter is different to going online on a MindGeek platform and that there needs to be appropriate tools and appropriate um, approaches for the different risks that a child can face in those different digital transactions. Um, now, under the BIC platform, we had uh, some actions. We have committed ourselves to doing a technical standard. And since Ian men mentioned work that is going on on standards, what I can say, and I'm really delighted about, is that we are very complementary. There's a lot of work going on in this field, but it's all very complementary and it's all reinforcing and supporting each other. So the standard that Ian mentioned is looking at age assurance processes, looking at sort of what does it mean to have age assurance and fitting some, proposing some sort of classification of that risk-based approach. And when I talk about a technical standard that is what we're pursuing now, and we're going to start pre-work with Etsy, one of the EU uh, technical standardization organizations this month, is looking at a real technical standard. And we're gonna start with what we're deeming age verification, which would be to have the most certainty that the user is over 18, but to do so in a privacy preserving way and really looking at the use case of access to porn, because as we've heard, there's really no discussion of that. A nine-year-old, a 13-year-old should not be viewing what would be X-rated content in the old days when you only had TV and cinema as, as, as releases for that sort of material or, or videos later on. Um, and so that's where we're focusing our, um, our resources at the moment with our standard, because we think that's where the biggest harm is. It's where there is the biggest need of action. And when we get that to work, then we can see what the trickle down effect is from that. Um, so as I say, we're complementing work that's going on there across, across uh, well, really internationally and partly inspired by Five Rights and their great work also on the age appropriate design framework uh, that we've heard about. So we agree that we need to raise awareness, raise awareness for industry, but also raise awareness, I think, for the public and to give assurance also to families. So one of the things that we're also doing ourselves unilaterally is looking at putting information on our betterinternetforkids.eu portal. That's where we have all our resources for child protection, child safety, child empowerment. Um, We'll be starting to populate that. It's called an age assurance toolkit. I hate the word toolkit. It's actually sort of an info kit. Um, and explaining, you know, what the terms mean, what the different solutions are. And 20th of April, we release a study that we've commissioned, which really pulls together a lot of the, the, the strands that have been mentioned, what type of technology, what types of risks, what type of legal content. Um, and that will come out 20th of April, the day that the DSA starts to apply to these three large, very large um, uh, porn platforms. Um, there also will be in due course an assessment tool there for industry, which also I think fits in a bit with this process approach that we're looking at in this standard sort of saying to industry, this is how you know if this concerns you, because in most cases it will concern you. So that's that. Now, two things, if I've just got a little bit longer, two really important things I do need to talk to you about. First of all, a task force. How are we trying to navigate our way together with the member states, with ERGA, responsible for the AVMSD at European level, and the EDPB, responsible for the GDPR, who we're bringing out, we're very glad to have it, their opinion, but making sure that we all pull in the same direction, because we know we all want to achieve the same thing. Can we make sure that we're consistent and coherent when we're talking to industry and that we don't give them any wriggle room to say, oh, well, I can't do that because they've asked me to do that. So as of this January, we created a task force for the member states 
with ERGA, with the EDPB, um, where we can learn, where we can share, but also where we can really work on a common approach and that we make sure we, we avoid fragmentation and we stay consistent. Um, and that is proving very uh, actively supported. There is a lot of political support across Europe at European level, but also at member state level. And as we've heard, there are lots of different initiatives and we're trying to make sure like the French with the double blind approach and the, the approach from Spain. Although different countries, of course, have different approaches. We are united in diversity within Europe. We are trying to make sure that we um, have common ground and that we have common agreement on how we approach this really important topic. And that leads to my last point, then I will be quiet, I promise, is the EU digital identity regulation. Now, we know there's not going to be a one size fits all in terms of these solutions. You know, Julie already mentioned six that could be effective in different circumstances. We also don't want to stamp out innovation because, you know, who knows what's going to come up and there might be a fantastic solution just down the road. But we think the digital wallet, uh, the, the law will be published very soon in the OJ, probably this month, I think. It already has the it has some very strong advantages. We've already navigated with the co-legislator between this question of freedom for the user and actually protection. So those questions, that, that weighing up of that balance between doing what you want, but also making sure that you actually jump through some hoops so that if you're over 18, you're seen to be over 18. If it's a protected space for children, you're not over 18 or over 16 or 13 or whatever it is. We will have interoperability, which for us, obviously, we're talking about interoperability across Europe and across the member states. It is designed in a way that you can share an attribute. So 18 plus, yes or no, not I am June and I live in Luxembourg and I like not red Nikes, but whatever. So it's really very data pre pre um, preserving, what's the word, very private in terms of data. So say all member states will have to offer it. And also, thanks to the legislative process, all very large online platforms and very large search engines will have to respect it as a way of proving age. So we've got a lot going in its favour. We also, so this, it's the standards of the digital wallet that we think the technical requirements of anything that is age verification has to meet because we've already got a bar there and it's fairly high. We are now starting to work on pilot projects with the member states, although formally it has to be in action by 2026. We don't want to sit around and we're not going to sit around and wait for two years. We're starting with pilots. We're starting with proof of concepts. There have already been some pilots already running in different contexts. We're looking at it in the context of uh, child protection. And so we are very optimistic that this is going to be the day game changer and that the days of the, the tick box, like Ian says, you know, in a few years time, we really will look back and think, how on earth did we let that happen? So that's a quick topo from me of all the things we're doing on our side. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, June. Uh, indeed, United in Diversity. I think that's, uh, that indeed captures it. Uh, united around, uh, I think, principles. I think we have heard proportionate risk-based, uh, the importance of in interoperability, united in geographies, trying to avoid fragmentation, and of course, bringing together, as, as you're doing, uh, the privacy uh, actors and, and authorities, the audiovisual and the children's rights uh, community. I think that's, that's extremely uh, important. Um, so, in terms of how to indeed square different approaches, let me a bit dwell a bit more into one in particular, uh, the Spanish example. We have here um, Luis de Salvador Carrasco, director at, at the Spanish Data Protection Authority, who will provide a bit more uh, flesh and detail about what they see as the, uh, as the solution of this conundrum that we're here to talk about. Please, Salvador. Thank you, Andrea, and it's for me it's a pleasure to stay here. And I want, first of, of all, I want to congratulate the, the person that fixed the, the title of the session, <laughs> Demystify HHO Assurance. I think that it is so important to demystify some things that many people is trying to transmit. It is possible to make a safe internet for children, but we have to work on it. And it's possible to have a niche verification. But we have to work on it and to get the commitment of not only the regulators, but the industry too. 
I remember when uh, Mar España came to us and asked, please, is this really possible? Or we are always doing a set of principles on what to do, but not how to do. And it was a tremendous challenge for us, but thanks of all, we have a very motivating, honest, uncompromised boss. And we, we were so motivated to, to find a solution. And now we can say it is possible to find that solution of verification. It is possible to make a verification a tool anonymous, verified, and that give protection to the children by default. What is that means? That we don't should move the burden of proof on the children, but the burden of proof to the adults, the ones that they have the tools and they have to what to do to the things. That we don't need to share personal data with third parties and to keep the control of our data and our verification on our hands. As I said, Mark, we don't need to, and we shouldn't, to trust in third parties of internet services. It is possible to make it uh, verified in not to have the problems that arise in many cases for fundamental rights with the age estimation systems. And as uh, said Jung uh, before, we need to make an independence of the, our identity provider from the tools to age verification. It is different. We have tools uh, for, uh, we have identity providers. And the identity providers means that our identity is a right. It's not a service that somebody else has to give to us. And it's important to give, uh, to to keep this right in our hands, not to depend of a third party and to create new identity frameworks just for age verification when this is not needed. And then we are compromising our identity. We have cases in, in Spain regarding what happened with your identity relies on an internet service and you lose your identity. And it is uh, very important that with this independence we can make a solution that this is the solution pro uh, proposed by the Spanish DPA that is universal. Because if you don't relate to a specific identity provider, we are not doing a solution that works in Spain or in Europe. But it is, we can scale that solution to the, to the, to the whole uh, world. And it's so important, something that sometimes we forget, and this is very related with the new regulation in, in Europe. We cannot do a scheme that creates a new systematic risk in Internet. We have a lot of sources of systematic risk. Then creating new identity frameworks, and we depend to uh, these identity uh, frameworks to access to Internet, we are creating another systematic risk. We have a problem, but if we independence that, we dampen the identity providers from the age verification, then we can avoid such kind of risk. When we are talking about um, how to do this, it's because we have to change the point of view. The point of view to afford the protection of children in the internet. We have to change from the block point of view, the blocking systems, to the ones that enable the access to dangerous uh, con uh, contents. And take into account that if we focus that you have access to internet and the system will be unenabled, is your, not your age, but your authorization to access the one that will give you that solution. I have to take into account that uh, we were developing this solution focusing not only that could be universal, but two that could be integrated with other tools that will be complementary to protect the children in internet, like the parental controls, the DNS configurations, the router configurations, and, and so on. Another point that I think that it is uh, so important to take in, into account 
is that currently there are several now industry projects regarding this approach. Not only the project of the, the, the state that is the most important, but there are, uh, the industry has uh, found here a chance and a new opportunity to develop products. And everything I, we have to take into account is that we have to protect not the children only from the risk of some content. It is the content risk, of course, but it is the contact risk. Who can access our children? There is the conduct risk. We were talking about the patterns or uh, other kind of we can find in internet. And of course, there is the contract risk too. When we have to face the, the age verification, we have to face it thinking about the best interest of children, the fundamental rights of the children too, but the fundamental rights of all users in internet. And the control should be in the hands of, of, the, of the citizens regarding that. Therefore, age verification is not the final purpose. Age verification is just a tool to protect fundamental rights, starting for them from the fundamental rights of the children. And of course, it shouldn't create new risk, like the risk that I was uh, talking before. Uh, when we were thinking about this, this solution, we were thinking that the first thing is that we shouldn't put the kids in danger. Many of the approach to protect the children, they are waiting that the children is exposed, the, the children is on the stake, the children is accessed by somebody to react. And how to react? With surveillance, with tracking, with profiling, and so on. When we are, um, we, we want to afford the protection of the children, we have to look for protection of the children by default. Not wait that we have a problem and then we have to react. No, it should be in advance. We shouldn't put the children in such danger in advance and avoid such surveillance or tracking of all the, of the citizens. Uh, I have of the opinion that there is no vulnerable people, even the children. There is people that is put in situations of vulnerability. That is something very different. And what we have done with internet up to now is to put the children in a situation of vulnerability. But where we are focusing in strategies that uh, rely on massive surveillance, tracking, profiling, and strategies that works not in advance, but after the damage and the harm has been produced, we are putting a lot of people to invulnerability. When we collect the age, the address, the identity, we put in danger the children, we put in danger the, the, our elderly people, but we are putting in danger all of you, mainly VIPs, persons of special interest, everybody is put in danger. And it is possible not to do so when we are talking about the age verification and the protection of the children. As I said, uh, what we are uh, very worried and when we focus on how to develop this solution, the first thing is, is that the children shouldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. This solution should rely on the adults. This is the adults that should have to do something to access to some content, not in a restrictive way, but a specific content that it really makes harm to the children. The children by default shouldn't be able to do so or shouldn't uh, need to have an ID or an identification. I think that it is one of the most important topics. It should be impossible to, it should be impossible to find, locate, track, and make surveillance on children. Because sooner or later, the data will be used for profiling, monetization. They will use to adjust addictive patterns, dark patterns. They will be leaked because there will be data breaches, misuse, insiders, and so on. And finally, if we 
take approaches to locate people, but children, there is one fundamental right that will be in danger, that it is the physical integrity. We are talking about physical integrity and later psychological integrity. And I have here one note of one minute. <laughs> then thank you very much for your time and your attention. Thank you, thank you, Luis. And uh, uh, I think you made a very, uh, very good point there, or you captured it very well. Not an end in itself, not a purpose. Uh, and indeed, age verification should should never be seen as as an end or a purpose in itself, but really a means to to protect and and empower as well children. So let me uh, turn uh, uh, finally to Amy, um, and to probably the the most important voice in the debate, uh, which is the children voice. Um, what uh, do you see as the most important perspectives of children on age verification, which is such a technical issue, but at the same time, such a, a, a crucially uh, tangible issue for them? Thank you so much, Andrea, and everyone for your uh, remarks and comments so far. Indeed, I mean, bringing the voices of children to this debate is not peripheral. It's actually very central. You know, what are children thinking and feeling about their digital lives? Um, and how can we as adults take our responsibility forward while also respecting their right to all of their rights to information, to access and to have their voice heard and to participate in decisions made about their lives. So I'm here today representing it international, but I'll also be speaking um, shamelessly about a report that we launched last week with Eurochild and Teldes on Netherlands who are in the room. Um, but for, for, for good reason that we've been speaking to children about their diverse perspectives on their digital lives. So about a, a range of um, uh, online safety issues. ECPAT is very focused on ending the sexual exploitation of children. Um, but often we found, and we certainly found here, that to frame that conversation with children, you often, um, it's more relevant to them to speak about their digital lives and to speak about the range, because let's face it, it's not just sexual exploitation and abuse. It's a range of issues that this report and others show um, are becoming normalized in children's lives. You know, their, their tolerance for, for risk and harm, which is not always bad. There, there is good risk, there's healthy risk, there's even healthy mishaps, um, but their tolerance is increasing. So what we hear and heard children say is they only tell their parents or their caregivers the really bad stuff. And this is a situation that is, is you know, we need to take, uh, I think, very seriously. Um, before I go a little bit into the data, because I'm very mindful of, of the time, um, I wanted to, I mean, it was so encouraging to hear some of the, many of the comments, all of the comments that have been made so far today, but I just wanted to sort of maybe repeat them because I think they all merit repeating um, that, that, you know, we as ECPAT, and I know many of our partners um, that we work with um, in the EU and, and globally, um, think that, you know, when we look at the issue of edge assurance, we have to think about the why and the how. And there are a number of things I think we need to do. And I, I really, you know, support um, and a few comments today. We need to be demystifying technology, not only around age assurance, but in general. You know, the debates that we're having around technology are becoming more complex than they need to be. Because actually what we're talking about is the role that technology is playing in our lives. And we're at this sort of transitional moment where we have to decide what role we want certain technologies to play in the lives of us and the lives of our children. So these are crucial conversation. You know, children are not data. They are, they are children, right? Um, I think we need to acknowledge, and again, you know, it, it bears uh, it, repeating the age assurance, age verification, whatever term terminology we give to it, um, is an approach. Um, it's not about one one technology or one tool or one policy, and it sits within a broader range of of, of um, uh, prevention and and, and response uh, um, uh, narratives and, and, and approaches. And June, you mentioned some of those. You know, whether it's education um, and other things. Um, and we need to be, one of the things that I think is crucial is we need to be critically accessing narratives, perhaps not in this room, but that do exist around um, restrictions on the online world being inherently negative. Um, in fact, you know, we, we have well-established principles, as have been mentioned today, for restricting access based on health, uh, whether it's alcohol, tobacco, um, and other services. Um, and we need to be having better 
um, and more intelligent conversations in society about what that means um, in the online world. Um, and we need to be framing the conversation in a clear manner, using common terminology, using terms that everyone can understand. Um, and also, I, I, I like this idea of reversing the burden of proof, because age assurance is not just about restricting, it's not about restricting children's access other than in certain circumstances which we can agree upon, is about creating safe spaces. And that also means we have to shift the burden onto adults um, to prove uh, that they should be or should not be in a certain uh, certain place. Um, I just want to also point out that, you know, particularly, but not only in the case of sexual exploitation and abuse, um, if we were to um, all leave this room today agreeing, agreeing that age assurance was, was not necessary, um, that we should be educating children to sort of stay safe and, and report things that happen to them, you know, it's, it, it's worth repeating the point that children don't disclose. Uh, you know, they disclose in very low numbers. And um, we also found in the report, I'll be um, giving a bit more detail on, as I said, that, that children are normalizing risks. So they're not telling the things that, that we need to be knowing necessarily um, to, to help keep them safe and empower them. Um, and yeah, so turning now to, to what children have actually been saying to us, you know, ECPAT and partners have been working hard in recent years to actually bring the public voice. So the public, the, the voice of adults, the voice of caregivers, the voice of the voting uh, public, may I say, in, a, in, a, in, in the months before elections um, to, to the debates that really matter about technology and society. Um, we, as ECPAT, um, um, with the NSPCC in the UK last year, um, did a public opinion poll of 25,000 adults in the UK, 71% um, um, in, in, sorry, not in the UK, um, across 16 European countries. And we found that 71% said they, they would be willing to compromise some of their privacy if it meant protecting children online. Um, and actually, many of them um, said that, that uh, um, uh, an MEP... Um, talking positively about protecting children on the internet would have a positive influence on their vote. So these are issues that matter to, to the voting public, and I think we also need to remember that. So to the most important part, what are children saying and what have children been saying? So I'm basing this um, on, on what children have been saying um, um, in the uh, voice project that we've worked on worked on and this is a report you can find online it's called speaking up for change and i think one of the most important things that i want to convey is that children um spontaneously and frequently talked about age assurance yes they use different terminology some would say age verification but they wanted to talk about this issue and it's an issue they're very well aware of and the second point is they were not fully opposed to this of course, children talk about not wanting um, their access limited, but children also talk about this in many areas of their lives. You know, our role of adults is to protect and provide spaces where they can take risks um, and, and are safe. Um, so I think it's important to point this out that um, we have been hearing arguments saying that children don't want restrictions. Um, and actually, what children tell us is this is not true. Um, and almost 60 percent of the survey children that we spoke to in um, 15 countries, we spoke to almost 500 children in focused focus group discussions with experts in delivering these kind of meetings. Um, almost 60% said that it's okay for a platform to ask for their age and verify it. Um, and, you know, some of the positive views were they want age appropriate experiences. They are being bombarded with content that they upsets them, annoys them, um, and may cause them more severe harm. Um, and so they talk about age appropriate experiences and they talk about wanting to know and thinking it's okay that other people know the age of users. So they know who they they're talking to and who they're having contact with. Um, you know, some of their concerns, unsurprisingly, relate to the, the potential misuse of their data. This is something that children are very aware of because the adults in their lives are talking about it and it's something that children are talking about a lot um, and also about the limitations to online experience. So, of course, you know, um, the, the, the goal is not to limit their experiences, but to make sure they're not exposed to experiences that are um, uh, uh, not appropriate for their age. Because, of course, many children admit to using the wrong age to access a service that they're not supposed to be accessing. Um, I think that's um, part and parcel of them being children. And it can be as innocent as, as, as uh, you know, one child has said in one of the focus groups, if we only watch films for our age, nothing will be cool. You know, so we have to remember that the Internet and digital environments are places that children enjoy being. And we have to create those en environments where, as others have said, they can thrive. Um, 
And um, some children, interestingly, and I'll finish on these points, um, many children um, indicated that age assurance is OK, but it depends on the situation. So, and they actually made some interesting differenti differentiations between uh, types of platform, for example, in one country between social media and gaming environments. You know, again, we're, these are children's views, but I think they're interesting. And I think the final point, which which I find um, we found very interesting, is that children reported they were confident in their own ability to protect themselves, so they didn't really need age verification. But they actually felt for all their peers um, that was a, that was a good thing. So you know, there's clearly an awareness that age verification or age assurance plays an important role in their lives, and they particularly talked about younger children. and the, And we've heard this in other um, surveys that uh, other research that we have done, um, speaking with um, survivors of sexual exploitation abuse that express concerns about younger children experiencing what they've experienced um, so this is something they're very very aware of um, I can end with a quote from one girl in the Netherlands who said for myself I sometimes find age verification unnecessary but I would be devastated if my child could see everything because that is just unsafe I think verification is good because people can easily lie about who they are and about their age so I will stop there, um, but it's been really a fruitful discussion and I, I, I'm glad to be able to bring the voices of children to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, I mean, it was uh, extremely powerful and uh, we, we should have much more time uh, to discuss all of this, the technical level and the children's rights perspective. And I'm sorry we, we don't, uh, or at least not now and not today. So I will just turn to our last, uh, very last speaker, um, our very own Duncan McCann, Head of Accountability at Five Rights, um, to give a, a last sort of children's rights perspective on uh, the challenges or perhaps the, the homework that we all as you know, children's rights, uh, data protection, lawmakers, uh, regulators and industry have to, to do or work on to, to make this a reality as soon as possible. Duncan. Is yours. Thanks. Uh, great. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, thanks to everybody that's participated. It's been such an interesting discussion across so many different um, perspectives. So um, in my five minutes, I'm just going to try and give a sense of what I believe are some of the work that still needs to be done to turn what we've all talked about, which is the potential that age assurance can have to it for it to actually deliver. You know, and just to start off, I think it's really important to be clear that technically speaking, uh, it is absolutely possible to deliver an age assurance system that respects the privacy of the user, which means basically doesn't collect any additional data that was already available, is secure. That data then needs to be secure either in rest or in transit and where stored. And obviously, sometimes there are also legal obligations to store that data for a length of time to provide an opportunity to audit and reflect. Um, and then it has to be inclusive as well. There is no point in us rolling out this technology if 5, 10, 15% of people uh, just don't have access to it. And so that's why, again, it's always important to remember that no single solution of age assurance, and indeed, you know, we've heard some people talk about the six different methods. Um, at Five Rights, we talk about the 10 different methods, but no single one of them can actually be inclusive for everybody. If we're talking about IDs, not everybody has IDs, especially children. If we're talking about facial analysis scans, uh, faces that differ from the norm, children that look very young, um, people that have uh, facial um, um, abnormalities, all of this can really affect it. And so it's important to think about inclusive. But it's important to remember that it is absolutely possible today to design a system that is all of those things. The real challenge is not, is that possible technically, but how do we ensure that when deployed in the real world, we only see age assurance systems implemented that are privacy preserving, secure and inclusive. Um, and unfortunately, this really brings me to, you know, kind of two of the challenges that I just want to bring. And obviously, you know, it's a short intervention. And so there are definitely more to consider. The first one is really around children is that, you know, there's actually still some technical development to make it really work at differentiating, say, a 10, a 12 and a 14 year old from each other where you need to provide either a different experience, a different entrance and things like that. You know, as Ian rightly reflected, you know, the cutting age estimation technology, and that's really where most children are going to be using it. Children don't have ID, you know, most many children do not have ID cards, passports, and certainly not obviously the credit and financial documentation that um, are required. 
If the average error is about a year and a half, that makes it very hard to distinguish that 10, 12 and 14 year old from each other. So there is definitely still some technical work to do at understanding and differentiating between those very particular ages of children. Age assurance is much better at doing, are you an adult or are you a child? And there again, we're seeing very clearly that that's a piece of uh, a technical ability that it has, it has very well. And this isn't just, uh, and this is something that, you know, is really holding, I think, back the, the implementation of technology. And I've spoken to many technology companies who are constantly evaluating age assurance systems but do not find that it is suitable yet for those that work of distinguishing different child ages. Now, I think what's good about that problem is that it is relatively simple to, uh, 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 you know, there is a linear improvement going on in this technology all the time, and we will absolutely get there. The second challenge is, I think, much more complicated. Um, and it's the, it's the difference between doing age assurance well uh, but also there are obviously real cost constraints well, instead of doing it well, I could do it cheaply. And then obviously there are also problems about whose interests am I doing this? Am I doing it in the interest of protecting the user or actually can I start to use some of that data? Am I doing it in the own, in the platform's uh, own interest? Um, and again, so this is again, another similar problem. How do we really ensure that only good age assurance is, um, um, is implemented? And again, one of the real challenges here is, we are not asking for age assurance systems to be implemented in the good Samaritans of the internet, yeah, of the digital, of our digital infrastructure. We are asking age assurance systems to be placed on some of the least trustworthy places of the internet, which have shown a long track record of not respecting our, the users, not respecting our data rights. This could be uh, pornography companies who are, you know, uh, rapidly, you know, have been extracting our data and using it uh, uh, a lot, uh, again, in contravention of the law. And similarly to social media companies, if we were asking them to put age assurance, social media companies still six years on are non-compliant with whole sections of uh, GDPR, let alone obviously with the new regulations coming in. So we are asking companies that have a long track record of abusing their users, not treating them properly and failing to follow the law. Um, and so we need to be mindful when giving them the power, then forcing them to do this additional check. And that's why there's some attractiveness, I think, to the proposal, say, proposed by the Spanish today, but also that have been proposed by the Keneal and others to kind of take it out of uh, the market and have it done by, uh, by another arbiter. You know, um, as well as then asking it for, to be in some of the riskiest places of the internet with companies that have a bad track record, cost is again going to be a really, really big issue for uh, age assurance. If we are asking companies to put an upfront cost on their business in order to hopefully recoup it later from the users through advertising or use or so on, uh, there is going to be a strong incentive to minimize the cost of that service. And privacy costs money, security costs money and inclusiveness costs money. So all the things that we think are good about age assurance add cost onto age assurance. And now some companies who really care, and indeed uh, we're engaged with one company that you know does this really, really well, uh, they pay a premium for their age assurance provider to ensure that no data is ever reused, all data is automatically deleted, that it's you know super, super secure. Um, and this company, on a monthly basis, is approached by other age assurance vendors that says, why are you going with this expensive age assurance vendor? I can give you 50% off, but the cost of that 50% off is lower security, uh, less privacy, and less inclusiveness. So how can we ensure that companies only go for these gold-plated, the, the good examples? And again, and this brings me back to why, you know, standards, which is something that's been really fundamental to uh, five rights work are so important because unless we build that foundational standard on which only uh, solutions that meet or exceed that standard can be implemented, then we run really uh, a massive uh, potential risk uh, in the wide scale deployment um, of age assurance. Um, I have plenty, many of other things to say, but I know that I'm already uh, well over time. So I think I'll stop my intervention there and hopefully leave time for maybe a couple of questions from Andrea before we close up the session. So yeah, thank you very much.
Thanks a lot, Duncan. And uh, uh, as much as I would love that, I've, uh, uh, I've been informed also that we, we need to actually wrap up uh, um, and we cannot go a lot over time. So I would hand back to uh, Emilio for, for a closing. I mean, I think we, we heard a lot of good, good points and I hope that uh, all the people in the room as well as in the panel can get in touch with, with each other separately. I think we heard it is possible uh, that, you know, the tech uh, isn't there yet, but it's definitely coming, so it just needs some some more push. It's not a silver bullet, it needs to be part of a system. It's not an end in itself, it needs to be focused on, on children uh, primarily. And uh, I think that this is really uh, a powerful narrative that we can use uh, on to develop this. And of course, standards, standards, standards from our perspective are also the basis to, to build this, this narrative. Emilio, please. Nothing good, Andrea. We are literally over time. So yeah, I'm not going to use my time for the conclusion. I'm happy to give up the time. You heard of me from me many times. So I just wanted to say that it's been great to have these wonderful speakers. And I think it's also thrilling for me once again to see that this is something, this, uh, this goal to make the internet a better place is actually shared among different actors. Um, and we see how important it is to work um, in a multi-stakeholder approach. And just to say that you know, and, and it, as intergroup on children's rights, we've been working tirelessly since the beginning of this Monday to ensure that the child rights perspective is always included in all the pieces of legislation. And it has been great to see a lot of progress. Uh, I must say, you know, the European Union has really taken a global leading role in the entire world. And, you know, coming from the European Union, we have a huge market of 150 million people, you know. The work that we do here together with wonderful colleagues in the European Commission is actually, it's going to be a trendsetter, not, not to the detriment of my wonderful British colleagues, just to say that, you know, there's, um, there's a huge potential to set the bar high. And the European Union, I think, has delivered, but not there yet. And I think it's really, we owe this to our citizens. We owe this to our children. Mar has explained wonderfully what are all the risks associated with the brain development. Thank you so much as well for bringing the health perspective. And I think it's fair to say the children as such are definitely more vulnerable. And I don't say this in a patronizing way. Come on, I am the Secretary General of the Intergroup on Children's Rights. I definitely do not see children as some just some individuals to be just pet that or just to be told. And that's why it was very important to also hear from Amy and the wonderful work that they did with the voice project at Lucas Vela at Fabiola from, uh, from, the, from your child. But it's also important and fair to say that they do are, they indeed are more vulnerable. If it's already hard for us adults to actually cope with these addictive and black patterns, as also was explained by Luis before, imagine for children, and the risk is not so much higher because it is also true that, you know, our brain develops up until the age of 25. And so, yeah, those risks are much higher and hit children much harder. So I'm very happy with we do all share the same goal. And, you know, now we are approaching the election of the European Parliament. We don't know what's going to happen. I really can wish and hope that we will have as a committed European Parliament as we did in this mandate. The same thing as well in the European Commission. Because, you know, the last point, just to say that unfortunately we tend to forget that it's not that it's easy to talk about children and children's rights, you know. I mean, I'm happy that Katarina, as a member of the European Parliament, has taken this as well as a priority. And Mara as well, in a wonderful and immense work that she has as director of the entire Spanish Data Protection Authority, has decided to make this a priority. But I just want to say this on a personal note, that unfortunately it takes one person, and most of the times it really gets down to personal commitment from politicians. Because, you know, children do not vote, so it's not a demographic that is particularly of interest of politicians in general. And so, yeah, I really can hope that we're gonna have much more people and the same commitment stemming from the same leadership is going to be replicated in the next parliamentary time and in the next European Commission. Thank you so much for the attention. Thank you so much for all the wonderful speakers. Thanks.